Okay, my name is Alex Chinook, and my studio, we amalgamate different disciplines. So I'm interested in sculpture, but also other disciplines such as architecture and engineering and construction. And we're particularly interested in the materials and the processes and the sculptural possibilities, therefore, of modern industry. Um, the work we create exists in the public realm, temporarily, always. This is a piece we created called um, Telling the Truth Through False Teeth. And we took a dilapidated factory in Hackney about two years ago, and we created the illusion that every single window across its facade, 312 of them, had been identically smashed and cracked. And we did that using 1,248 pieces of glass. Now, this very neatly kind of embodies a lot of the different things that we're interested in, the kind of the philosophy that we bring to our project. Um, each thing that we create is unquestionably playful, but the path that we take to get to them is incredibly complex. And what a key consideration is for us is this idea of cultural accessibility. And in our opinion, and my a kind of philosophy that hopefully my projects celebrate, is that I think that public art has to be for the public, and it has a great responsibility to the public. And there's very little room, in my opinion, for intellectual or cultural elitism. And it has to be inviting in lots of different ways. And we do that, firstly, through this kind of idea of playfulness and often illusion, um, but also through kind of sculptural and physical spectacle. So we try to create these very physical feats, which are kind of very impressive, but simultaneously very engaging and kind of, at times, um, I suppose, humorous. Another project that we created was in Margate. Um, this is called From the Knees of My Nose to the Belly of My Toes. And as you can see, we created the illusion that the entire facade of a residential property had slipped into the front garden. Now, this particular property had stood dilapidated, water damaged and fire damaged for 11 years, and it was an incredible eyesore. So it presented itself as an incredible opportunity to come in and try to introduce something positive. Now, when creating artworks of this size, I'm very conscious that they could be dominating of their environment. So every single decision we make is tuned and inspired by the visual and material language of the district. Increasingly, we consider other things, but this was kind of early stages of my practice, and this is one of the key considerations. This was a project that we started um, a week after we finished the sliding house, and this is just south of Blackfriars Bridge. It's called Under the Weather But Over the Moon. And here we created, the, well, we used the existing architectural silhouette and simply created the illusion that the entire facade had been turned upside down. Now, this is a very, very large public sculpture. But again, because we use the visual and material language of the district and the architecture and the buildings that surround it, it has the ability to disappear. And I feel that public sculpture should never scream for attention. I think you should find it before it finds you. Otherwise, I think it becomes overly obtrusive and inconsiderate to the space in which it stands. And I think good design, and when you're dealing with projects on this kind of scale, with the administration or technical and logistical obstacles that they present, good design is one that considers not only aesthetics, but also the way it performs and the way it behaves. And I think this architectural and visual integration is essential. It's worth saying that up to this point, all three projects we produced with absolutely no money. So um, while working on other jobs, I dedicated all of my time to facilitating the relationships and the resources to make it possible. So one thing that I do is we collaborate constantly with British industry and the companies across it. And what we began to recognize was that there was an incredible opportunity where sculptural ambition and sculptural objectives could be realized with the experience, materials, processes, and resources of industry. In exchange, they were hungry for marketing material and the use of their product and material. And it's, it was a key factor in, I guess, facilitating the growth of my practice and hopefully my career, where there are so many artists in the world, the only route to progress is where you forge your own path. And we did that via facilitating such relationships. This was a project that we created for Covent Garden Piazza. It's called Take My Lightning But Don't Steal My Thunder. Here, as you can see, we created the illusion that the entire top of the building was hovering in midair, and there was absolutely nothing between the two structures. The only connecting point was the market store to the right-hand side. Now, at this point, this is when we really began to consider how something not only architecturally integrates into the place in which it stands, which this does so also, but this requirement was done through necessity, because we started to introduce 
the obstacles that projects of this scale and complexity realize. One of them is temporary planning licenses. So we have to navigate those things. Also, it's a listed building behind it, of course. It's a very celebrated and sacred one. So every single decision you make has to be celebratory of the building that it stands in front of. So of course, we tuned it visually so it was harmonious with the structure behind. But one of the most sacred and protected views and listed views is through the central avenue of the piazza. So we had to design a structure that when looking from the other side of the piazza, you could see absolutely nothing. And of course, it embodies all of the different considerations that my practice does. We take this kind of very playful and surreal route to spectacle. But the engineering behind this was considerable and complex. In the market stall on the right-hand side, that acts as a counterweight, and there were 16 tons of steel resting within that market stall. To install it, it required 10 trucks, large Arctic trucks, going onto Covent Garden Piazza. At one stage, there was two cranes on the piazza, and we essentially shut the piazza. At one stage, the manager of the Disney store came out and said they were going to sue me. And <laughs> Disney have better lawyers than I do, I'm sure. Now, what we also began to consider was how we can tune our sculptural decisions and the way we conceive an idea to the people who would be experiencing it and the typical demographic that would experience it, but not only the type of person, it's how they use and how they occupy the space. So when considering Covent Garden Piazza, we started to think about the idea that people don't, it's not a place that people go to every day, typically. It's somewhere where Londoners might visit once a month, people in the UK might visit once a year, and people outside the UK might visit once a lifetime. So we had to conceive something that was about impact. And you know, it's a bit of a faux pas in a kind of, for an artist to say this, but we had to, to consider something that worked in an Instagram culture. We also have responsibilities to the people paying for it and the commissioners, and their principal objective was to generate media attention and get people visiting and excited about Common Garden Piazza. And I, I think we achieved it. It was on the national news in 35 different countries, and the footfall of Common Garden Piazza for the month that it was there was um, increased by 20%. So in, in lots of different ways, it was considered a success. Now, one thing I touched on previously was this idea of temporary activity. For me, temporary activity is a license and it's a freedom for cultural and sculptural ambition. There's absolutely no way I would have been able to and should have been able to, of course, install this sculpture if it was permanent. I also like this idea of a, culturally, a changing cultural landscape across the city where people can come and experience something and then it changes, which, you know, the, the talks tonight have been a celebration of this philosophy, I think, which encourages a fresh footfall and a revised visit to the area. I also like the, the idea of impermanence because I think when an experience is gone, it can only be missed. And impermanence and legacy go hand in hand. And I think in a very fast-paced contemporary modern culture in which we exist, I think that idea of impermanence quite neatly weaves in. And with that philosophy in mind, we designed this. Now, this was called a pound of flesh for 50p. And this was, we realized this in the same two weeks. This opened in the same two weeks as the hovering building. And in the same two weeks, I had a baby. So it, it, I would say it was the worst and best two weeks of my life. But for this particular project, what we did was we worked with a wax manufacturer, the largest, largest wax manufacturer in Europe. And we made 7,500 bricks in wax. Now, these were in both surface and aesthetics, indistinguishable from real bricks. And then we made windows and doors, all of them in wax. We even made the glass in wax. And then over 45 days, we melted the house. That's the wax bricks. That's how real they were. That was a sun kiss moment. Now, this idea completely celebrates this idea of impermanence, where it wasn't just a philosophy. It was the physical object and the performance itself. And this particularly hones in on this idea of tuning our sculptural decisions and our cultural decision making to how people use the district. So where Covent Garden was about impact and a one-off effect, this was just beside London Bridge Station, so it was on a real commuter path. So it allowed us to create a piece that was about transformation and change, because the people would experience it every day and it would change for 45 days. The nice thing about this piece was it was utterly organic. So it behaved in a way that we could never have expected. Everything that we make now is so engineered and so computer designed. A piece that we're working on at the moment has had an engineering practice, well, four of an engineering practice working full time for three months. So it was very nice to create something that took on its own uh, form. 
I felt like an artist again for a while, I suppose. And so just after this, again, with this idea of illusion, spectacle, construction, engineering, industry, we produced this piece on the South Bank. And here, we created an illusion that a real car was hanging upside down. And, well, this does many of the things that I've been explaining, I suppose. And I'd like to finish with the future. So, we were recently invited to create a piece or conceive an artwork for the London Design Festival. And the commissioners are a company called Night Dragon who are developing the Greenwich Peninsula. I think it's the largest planning application in the history of London. Now, the site is incredible. And so, given that it was the largest gas works in Europe on that site, and because there's gas towers and, of course, the Millennium Dome, there's this sculptural language of lattice steel and cables. So, with that thought process, with the visual and material language, and also the history of the site, which is always very important, we conceived this. And it's a full-size electricity pylon that seemingly stands on its tip. It leans 60 degrees. It's made from 1,186 meters of steel. There's 75 cubic meters of concrete in the ground. And there's four piles going 25 meters deep. It appears like a normal electricity pylon, but it's far from it. And this opens on September the 18th. So I invite you all to come and see it. And hopefully we've, we've, we've delivered it. Thank you.